Hello and welcome to another session of Com Law, Ethics and Diversity. In today's module, we examine third party evidence. And so there are a couple of cases that we will look at. There are some videos just so that we can put whatever is in the context of the module into deeper perspective. On my cover page, you'll notice three images. The first that relates to the Buffalo supermarket shooting. The second has to do with the El Basso shooting. And the third, an incident that occurred in the North Carolina area. Now let's look first of all at the ethics involved in these three instances, these three cases. At the time of preparing today's lecture, I did not have the Buffalo shooting in mind, but then I thought about something that is very current that you can relate to in a better way to really understand and focus in the issue as it relates to the ethics of the online assemblage of, I would say, platforms that people are using, including those who have perpetrated really serious crimes, those who have perpetu <laughs> perpetuated crimes against people, um, crimes that have resulted in what are you know usually framed as massacres, so that we understand the role of media, including social media platforms, in um, the discourses around the ethics of uh, you know communication law and what should be actually reported and how it should be reported. So the Buffalo shooting, um, this is the most recent incident that has caught the attention of, I would say, the Attorney General of the state of New York, as well as the governor. And the incident occurred on Saturday, May 14, 2022, in the height of shopping. The perpetrator in this case is Peyton Gendron, an 18-year-old who used a couple of platforms, including this court that was established in 2015, 4chan, and I believe subsequent to that, 8chan. Just to give you a bit of perspective in terms of the incident timeline, it happened on March 8th, um, whereby he made multiple visits to the site to map out the area, to check to see how many persons were actually shopping by ethnicity. And we actually had a reconnaissance to check to see what the floor layout looked like in that particular supermarket. There was a 180 page document that was posted online and a 672 page online diary that was intended to serve as a manual for future attackers. According to a CNN report, there are no fears about a copycatism um, of the act that was carried out at that particular supermarket in Buffalo. And you should know that the, um, the, 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 the person who carried out the, the, the Apps drove over 100 miles to actually shoot those victims at the supermarket. And so, again, some features of the crime. He live streamed um, the shooting on Twitch. Of course, it went viral and Twitch was unable to suspend in time before it went viral on other websites. And of course, a New York Attorney General James, she subsequently said that Twitch and Discord and the websites 4chan and 8chan, now known as 8con, um, with other unknown companies, are under the purview of the Attorney General's office to examine the legal ramifications of hosting somebody with the proclivity to commit a crime. Um, New York Governor Hochel was quoted as saying in a CNN report that the social media platforms have to take responsibility and they must be more oh. vigilant in monitoring the content and they must be held accountable for favoring engagement over public safety. And so in a letter to the Attorney General, the New York governor called for the investigation to determine whether specific companies have civil or criminal liability for their role in promoting, facilitating, or providing a platform to plan and promote violence in the context of what has been happening in the country as it relates to those hate crimes and crimes that are perpetrated against people of a certain racial group in terms of the profiling on the um, hate crimes that have occurred in the last couple of years. Now that's the first incident. Incident number two has to do with the Buffalo shooting. And so there are a couple of features of the Buffalo shooting. Um, I think I did share that with you. The incident number two has to do with the El Paso, Texas. At that time when that incident occurred, um, it was, really deemed to be the deadliest in, in, in which on the 30 minutes you had 22 people killed and 24 injured. Um, it was the 21st mass killing in the U.S. in 2019. Um, and this is before the COVID pandemic hit. And of course, it was deemed as a fifth public mass shooting. 
Um, just to go back to the timeline, in August 2019, Patrick Crucius entered a Walmart Supercenter and opened fire on victims um, who were mostly civilians. He used a semi-automatic weapon. And of course, it was said to be one of the seven deadliest by a single gunman in U.S. history. And like I said, the deadliest in 2019. Now, I'd like to share, I'd like to go back briefly with you and share some of what actually occurred so that you can see or have an idea if you have not accessed any video pertaining to the separate shooting incident. So I'm going to go back now to those videos to, uh, to try to give you some sort of deeper perspective in terms of what exactly transpired in the shooting incident um, that led to the deaths of those persons who are now victims. And of course, their family members will be mourning for a very, very long time as it relates to what occurred back then um, in starting with the Buffalo shooting. And then we'll go into what occurred in the Texas shooting. Um, and of course, all of these incidents were recorded separately by the, the various platforms in terms of what would have occurred back in 2022, which is just last year, Buffalo shooting. And then of course, um, the fact that the shooting, um, you know, the person who perpetrated the crime pleaded not guilty. This is really, um, it is it is just a situation that has caused a lot of emotions um, to go in all directions when he recently appeared in court. So I'm going to share with you now so that you have an idea as to how that particular case recently evolved, or I would say transpired in the context of the Buffalo shooting. So let's put it together. Handcuffed and flanked by officers, the Buffalo shooting suspect in court today for the second time since he allegedly gunned down 10 people. All were black. A grand jury indicting the 18 year old on first degree murder as the Justice Department is investigating the shooting spree as a hate crime and racially motivated violent extremism. Wearing an orange jumpsuit, the accused killer kept quiet before a crowded courtroom, including victims' families. Emotions spilling over as the suspect, who's pleaded not guilty, was escorted out. Hey, you're a coward. In the room, Bishop Glenwood Young, who lost his sister in law, Pearl. What was it like being just a matter of feet from this accused killer? It was so tense in, inside the courtroom. It was an eerie feeling to see this person walk in that had caused this traumatic uh, thing to happen in, in the community. The damages have, have already been done. Uh, these people will be hurting for the rest of their lives. I know I, I, I will. Tonight, in a small step towards normalcy, the yellow tape cordoning off the Topps grocery store is being replaced with fencing. This community centerpiece is no longer considered an active crime scene. Uh, Topps understands the role it plays in the Jefferson Avenue community and the role that this store plays in particular to the neighborhoods and honestly the role that, uh, that we play in the city of Buffalo. And it will take some time for us to understand exactly the specific timeline for opening. We want to make sure that it is done right and we open it in a respectful manner for our associates, our employees, and for the community at large. All right, Emily Aketa joins us now. Emily, we know, as you mentioned there, the tape has come down from around the Topps grocery store, but that community is still receiving threats? Yeah, that's right, Tom. Uh, the aftermath of the shooting continues to torment this community as threats target sporting events, restaurants, and schools. One nearby school district says up to a third of its students stayed home from school this week. Tom? Thanks for watching our YouTube. All right, so that was just an account of what was actually happening. A uh, report on the shooting incident that occurred last year as it relates to Pops grocery store and the use of the platform, various platforms that is, um, to actually indicate the intention to commit the crime. And like I said, Twitch, Discord, 4chan, and 8chan were used separately. And it was also alleged that there was a small group invitation just prior to minutes before the incident actually occurred. And so these are issues that are now engaging the attention of the Attorney General Office, as well as those who are legal luminaries who are examining 
the use of social media platforms to announce and as hints to committing hate crimes, so to speak. Now we come to the second incident, which is the Walmart shooting in El Paso, Texas um, in 2019, where, whereby Patrick Wood Perseus, he entered a Walmart supercenter and opened fire on civilians, and he also used a semi-automatic weapon. Um, this was said to be the seventh deadliest by a single gunman in the United States history, and of course the deadliest in 2019, um, whereby um, you know he killed 22 people. This is just me repeating what happened. But I'm saying all of this to say that he also used a, a, a platform, the, the message board 8chan, to post what was known as a manifesto. Now both incidents, the incident involving the young man in Buffalo, as well as the young man in El Paso, Texas, involved two things, the use of social media platforms, as well as a hate crime to perpetrate the, the, the shooting against persons who are of a particular ethnicity or race. In the case of the Buffalo shooting, uh, this young man here, Endron, targeted black um, shoppers at Tops. And in this particular case here in the Texas shooting, the target were the Hispanic people who were part of that community. And so lots of the theories that the investigators were following were based on the rhetoric around the takeover of immigrants or a certain class or culture race of people in terms of the population. And so the deaths of these particular um, people, the victims of the crime, really drew attention very closely to how it is that online platforms and their hosts are promoting hate crimes. Uh, questions pertaining to what liabilities they should or should not face continue to engage the attention of the policymakers. And weeks ago, we spoke about the fact that um, online platforms are really protected. But if the hosts are aware that they're promoting a particular crime or their intent is there in the language and how it is framed, then they have a right to take down the messages and not to host those particular types of rhetoric coming from people. And so HN, you will see it is, you know, very, very dark. They say that, you know, you know, the darkest reaches of the internet is what they're framing themselves and, as. And it says here that you can create your own image board for free with no experience or programming knowledge needed. This means that it's a, a platform open to anyone and everyone. It means that you don't have to have prior knowledge. There is no background, but you can actually just do whatever you'd like on this particular platform with little to no intervention whatsoever until something happens really um, deleterious to the public. Now, if we're looking at the ethics in the El Paso case, we'll notice that most media outlets reported on the manifesto that was posted and some of the media houses actually published excerpts from the manifesto while others linked the, the entire manifesto. And of course, they encouraged the audience to read it in its entirety. So there was no effort to actually expunge or remove, but they took whatever they saw there and they reprinted, all right? And so the entire incident was dubbed the Hispanic invasion and the excerpt coming from this young man who actually committed this act against the people at Walmart, he says, my whole life I have been preparing for a future that currently doesn't exist. The job of my dream will likely be automated Hispanics will take control of the local and state government of my beloved Texas, changing policy to better suit their needs. Now, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, he was found guilty of uh, a crime of, of murder. And of course, uh, they're probably not going to seek the death sentence, um, the death penalty, as a result of the fact that they're charging him on the hate crimes and gun laws. So he's likely to spend his life behind bars as a result of the crime that was actually committed. But I guess more in focus here for us as, you know, com law um, students is this whole notion of how do you use speech and how do you use social media platforms that are available to you openly to promote the hate speech and to also give the reader the impression that you're going to commit the crime. And of course, what do reporters do when they find the content and do they have the power to actually avert such crimes from happening?
Um, more importantly would be our next case, which has to do with the North Carolina shooting in 2006. In this case, this was not a, um, I would say, a mass shooting, but something was averted in time because he also used, um, you know, social media platform to talk about or to go on off on a tirade about his intention. Um, they found him to be mentally unstable. He was a 19-year-old Alvaro Costello, killed his dad, and then he went on a shooting spree on a local Orange County high school campus. Fortunately, no one was killed, but one person was actually injured in this particular instance. And so there were different bits and pieces of evidence that you know they're able to pull together in terms of what it is he had intended to do. And you will see here shortly, there is a video in the context of his intentions. So I'd like to share that video with you. An Orange County jury heard from the man accused of killing his father and firing a gun at his high school. Alvaro Castillo talks on videotapes about the need to kill students at Orange High. Aaron Hartness is here with more on today's proceedings. Aaron. Jurors spent most of the day hearing from the defendant through videotapes he made before the 2006 attack on Orange High School. I've been yelling at all my life. I've been told what to do all my freaking life, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Alvaro Castillo talks extensively about his time in the National Guard, calling himself a coward because he says he couldn't take the drill sergeants yelling at him. I took everything personally, and I hold grudges. That's my problem. I can't let it go. I can't. Castillo talks about guns as if they were people, saying they need you and can't reject you. He named a gun after a girl he had a crush on. At one point, he puts the gun in his mouth. From my cold, dead hand. That's how you're going to take this away from me. It's my weapon. I bought it. And I didn't have the right to have it. Castillo discusses his admiration for the suspects in the Columbine High shooting in 1999, saying they helped save students who died from a cruel world. He said he wanted to do the same thing at Orange High. Castillo said he loves the school and the attack was not about revenge, but rather a way to, quote, sacrifice students. And in the tapes, Castillo says he does not want to live in a mental hospital. Prosecutors introduced a tape into evidence of a trip Castillo took to visit Columbine, and that could also be played as evidence. David. Aaron Hartness. That was what occurred, I would say, years ago. It's a bit dated, but it just revealed the intent to commit the crime and, of course, the way in which it was actually revealed to the rest of the world through the platform that he actually used in the case of the Orange County High School campus shooting. Now, these were self-made videotapes, and of course, the actions were dispatched to local newspapers, namely the Raleigh News and Observer. And of course, this happened minutes before he went to the high school. So this is where now journalists got into action prior to, and they were able to avert the crisis. Now, what the videos actually reveal was a degree of mental like I said, and there are two videos here that will show the exact issues pertaining to his mental instability, and you can find these on the D12 platform. He got a life sentence by the Orange County Superior Court after three trial returned a guilty verdict on August 21, 2009. Now let's look at the ethics in all of these cases. Now, in the case of the North Carolina shooting, as well as the shooting in El Paso, Texas, um, newspaper editors in, you know, had several decisions that they had to make very, very quickly as it relates to what they were going to do with the content they had access to. And so questions pertaining to whether they should turn the videos over to the police, whether they should post any or all of the content on their websites, or whether they should give the public forum um, to someone who had committed such an awful crime. These were questions that they mulled over prior to releasing the content that they had. In the case of Castillo, the newspaper posted excerpts from the tape containing his explanation of his motives and thinking process on its website. And what they actually did, they left out footage of his father's dead body. These were not posted to the web because they're thinking about this whole notion of minimizing harm to those who were coming into contact with that particular egregious image and the exposure. So it's really about protecting the 
audience member from actually um, coming into contact with sensitive footage and image. And of course, they also left out his written confession that was sent with the videotape. All right. So that is really what was happening in the case of Alvaro Castillo. Now, I'd like to bring that as well to your attention. Um, I'm going to attempt to open the hyperlink so that we can actually watch together in terms of what happened. Um, and I think it has to do with the previous video that was actually, but I'd like for you to go back to that if you've missed it in my recent presentation um, just a couple of minutes ago. Now let's look at the application of the Radio Television Digital News Association Code of Ethics, which you can also obtain on B12. What does the Code of Ethics say with relation to the content that a journalist may come into contact with as it relates to crimes that I've described in the case of the Buffalo shooting, as well as what occurred in El Paso, Texas, and the Orange County shooting? What are their roles and responsibilities in terms of taking action? Now, according to the RTD and A Code of Ethics, there's some guiding principles and one of them, the very top one, speaks to a journalism's obligation to the public. A journalist really should place the public interest ahead of any commercial interest, political or personal interest. This basically means that the public's right to know and be safe should be held foremost, should be held sacred by the journalist rather than posting any video that is viral just for the purpose of selling that story. Many times we will see that citizen journalists engage in pulling out their cameras and they're sending the video viral, not necessarily considering the harm that is being caused to those who come into contact with early exposure. And so journalism really empowers the viewers and listeners and readers to make more informed decisions for themselves when they post those stories that have to do with the public interest. Invariably, they will not tell people what to believe or how to feel, but they will give them the facts. So that is their obligation. First, it is to the public. Now, in terms of ethical decision making, this should occur at every single step of the journalistic process, according to the RTDNA guiding principles. And this includes how you're selecting a story, how you're gathering the news, the production of that story, presentation, and delivery. Practitioners of ethical journalism says the RTDNA guiding principles seek diverse. They should seek diverse and even opposing opinions in order to reach better conclusions that can be clearly explained and effectively defended or when appropriate, revisited and revised. What this subclause is actually saying is that there are many sides of a story. And this is really pertaining to, I would say, part of the ethics in the news presentation assignment. Um, did the news establishment carry all sides? Was the side of the victim carried as it was, you know, carried in the same fervor or, or vigor as you carry the perpetrator's side or vice versa? Did you just carry um, the, 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 the perpetrator's side and not the victim's story? Or did you carry the person who is the, um, the plaintiff and not carry the defendant's side of the story? Ethically speaking, did the reporter strike a balance in the coverage in order to have the public receive all sides both lens and so that they can actually, um, you know, form their own conclusions about the story, so to speak, all right? Is it clearly explained and effectively defended when appropriate? The need to revise and revisit is also an ethical decision that should be taken by journalists in the context of whether they're carrying your stories, radio, television, or digitally on online platforms. Um, ethical decision-making like writing, photography, Designer anchoring requires skills as well that improve with study, diligence, and practice. This means that issues pertaining to photography and this whole notion of touching up or you know filters and stuff like that, these, these are all things that have to be taken into consideration when it comes to the guiding principles of the RTDNA. All right, so reporters need to know their limits. Producers need to know their limits if they're engaged in design or photography, and they need to understand to what extent their particular limits fit within the guidelines of the RTDNA. 
the code of ethics does not dictate what journalists should do in every single ethical predicament or situation. Rather, it offers resources to help journalists make better ethical decisions both on and off the job. Because once you are a journalist, there are times when someone may call you with a tip or they may say, here is something to cover. And the question is, do I cover it or does it fall outside of the lines of ethical practice? Um, you know, once a journalist, always a journalist on behalf of the people. So if you're a part of a community that has been framed a certain way and you're called to cover that story, you've got to make a decision as to whether you're going to right the wrongs as it relates to the narratives carried on that particular community or whether you're going to be a part of the problem in terms of reporting ethically on the issue before you and, of course, before that community. So it's really about the resources that the RTD and a Code of Ethics you know, the resources provided so that you can inform your own decisions as a journalist. Now, journalism, I should note, is really distinguished from other forms of content by these particular guiding principles I'll now share with you. Um, the first one, the facts should not get in the way of a good story. All right. So journalism really requires that really, um, you know, it's, it's not just about reporting remarks, claims, or comments. It's about factual reporting, accurate reporting. We say in journalism, when in doubt, find out or leave out. Um, there is no room for conjecture when it comes to journalism, but it is about verifying the facts. And so the verification has to provide context to tell the rest of the story. And of course, you're acknowledging that this is a story that is unfolding. In some cases, you will hear reporters or presenters saying that we will bring more news to you as the information becomes available or this is a developing story. So that language, that tentative language is, is what really tells the public or the audience that you don't have all the facts of the case of the story, but you're still investigating. And as the facts become available, you will shed more light on the situation. So it's about taking the time to verify rather than making assumptions so that whatever the context is, and it's telling the rest of the story, um, if there's any loophole, if there are any gaps, you are acknowledging the gaps and you're saying to the public that you will provide them with additional information. Now, truth and accuracy, as the RTDNA guidelines say, that should be above board, above all, the foremost consideration when it comes to making decisions around what stories to carry. And you would know it for those of you who are in journalism or those of you who intend to be a part of journalism as part of your career, Every single story has more than two sides in some instance, all right? Um, they may not always, you know, we, we, we're unable in some cases to fit every single detail into account, but it should be clear um, in terms of what is included in the story. Sometimes we say that we commit sins of omission because we've left out very, very important facts. And so you've got to go back to the drawing board to make sure that you're making amends or amending whatever was left out that is considered to be paramount in that issue. Now, scarce resources also, in some cases, will undermine how it is a story is covered and what gets put in and left out. And of course, deadline pressures and the competition among media houses to be first, um, to have the story covered or to be first to carry the story because of this whole need to have high ratings and following stuff like that. All right. So these do not, however, excuse this whole need to um, run with it if you don't have the facts. Um, again, the guidelines will hold all reporters accountable, radio, television, and those who are carrying news online. They will hold you accountable for cutting corners if you are really trying to you know, oversimplify um, issues that are very, very complex. Um, and you're not trying to wait until you have the verification in hand or you don't have the resources to get there on the, on the scene and you're looking at somebody else's account without the benefit of verification. These are not excuses to actually have some subpar news in the context of truth and accuracy above all. Um, trending or going viral, I alluded to the fact that in some cases there's a rush to print, a rush to go to press, I rush to be first on ear. And so a lot of times the, main, the mainstream media houses are competing with those other people who are out there collecting um, footage. And it's a lot of stuff that is trending. They may be influencers or they may be someone who has a little blog, 
all right? So the stuff is also going viral or it's exploding on social media. Somebody may say, hey, do you see what's trending right now? Um, you know, that particular incident that, that occurred, you know, the knee on the neck, um, that issue with the George Floyd um, knee on the neck that occurred, um, you know, not so long ago, it was someone who was in the streets actually happening. She just happened to be passing by when that issue occurred. And so she stood there and she filmed everything. So it went viral. And we know now that people who are quote unquote citizen journalists are pretty much in the habit of taking things or capturing things. In some cases, we may want to say thank God for social media, thank God for smartphones um, that are able to capture um, atrocities, in some cases, excesses in the context of, of, of what is happening in crime. And so, um, and instances that, are, you know, involve law enforcement. So trending and going viral or exploding on social media, um, this may seem to be triggers of the urgency to get the news because it's already trending. But again, reporters are held to a higher standard. If they're radio or television or online, they have to make sure that they're adhering to the strictest standards of accuracy. It does not mean that because it's trending or going viral, that that online establishment should take whatever is trending and reproduce, host it on the platform without actually indicating or without actually investigating the accuracy of that particular incident, all right? Now, facts will change over time, and we should note that. Facts will change over time because responsible reporting includes updating stories and amending archival versions to make them more accurate and to avoid misinformation um, you know, or misinforming those who, through a search, may stumble upon outdated material. So as I speak right now, you will find that something else is going on in one case or another, whether it's the case that involved the Buffalo shooting or a case that may have emerged even more recently than that, because there have been other shootings outside of the Buffalo shooting, including shootings at the nightclub and stuff like that. So issues are recurring every single day as it relates to how people are using platforms. And so we've got to be very, very mindful. Reporters have got to be mindful of making sure that they are actually updating their content as it relates to accuracy and obtaining accuracy. Uh, deception in news gathering, including surreptitious recording, conflicts with journalism's commitment to truth. And I need not go over this again, because if there's any way in which you're actually recording without the permission or you're infringing on someone's privacy and their, their breaches, then really this is in the category of deception and it's not um, allowed. It should, it's not condoned under the RTDNA guidelines. Um, when it comes to anonymity of sources, it is said that this deprives the audience of important relevant information. Um, when you dramatize or stage um, you know, issues that have happened, even when they're labeled as such, they can confuse or fool viewers or listeners or readers. So this is really some act here um, that is dissuaded. And this, hasn't, this has nothing to do with if you're actually protecting your sources. Um, this is the habitual use of according to an anonymous source, all right? Or you're staging because you're hiding the source because you don't want people to know that this is really something that did not occur but you're, you're trying to get some traction as a result of not doing the homework. Now, there's some justification that you may see in terms of stories being of great significance, but these cannot be adequately told without distortion when any creative liberties taken are clearly explained. So um, in cases where, you know, it's an issue where you have to be able to let people know what occurred and stuff like that, you, you have to explain that you're actually back on the scene and somebody who was an eyewitness is actually telling or recalling or recapping the incidents as, um, they, as they occurred on that particular scene. Now, again, we're dealing still with truth and accuracy and journalism challenges assumptions. It rejects stereotypes and it also eliminates even when it cannot eliminate ignorance. What essentially this point is saying under the RTDNA guidelines is that we do not go into the whole notion of assuming that because a crime has occurred in a committee in, in a community that is known for gang warfare, that it's as a result of the black and black quote unquote stereotypes of the crimes occurring in that particular community. If it's a crime that has occurred based on people who could have driven into the community who had nothing to do with the community, then journalism, the journalists who are on the scene, have got to challenge those assumptions by saying exactly how that particular crime occurred and who were the people 
involved in the crime. And this basically dismantles the structures associated with the stereotypes of the community. You know, you would hear things like what is happening in Chicago, in the city and all of that. But, you know, as soon as you hear, oh, my goodness, a crime has occurred in Chicago, you, you, you in your mind as a viewer, you may say it has to be that gang. But when the journalist who's on the ground really tells the story, right away, they're going in there not to actually assume or to actually say, oh, hell, it has to be that. They're rejecting that notion and they're actually saying to the public, this is exactly what has happened and they're dismantling the ignorance associated with it. And this is not to say that people will not hold fast to their beliefs about the stereotypes, but it's, it's a duty really of the journalist to dismantle those structures. And what ethical journalism will do will resist false dichotomies. It's either them or them. It's always going to be or never. And of course, it's a black and white thing when it comes to the incidents that are occurring in a particular community. They will consider the range of alternatives extremes in terms of how that particular issue has been historically reported. Moving right along, the RTDNA guidelines also speak to independence and transparency. And first, we're dealing with editorial independence, which may be a more ambitious goal today than ever before, because there are lots of media companies, even, you know, if not for profit, they have commercial or competitive or other interests, which impact their internal and external um, you know, dealings or their operations on a daily basis. And so governments, you know, are not necessarily, you know, with their hands directly <laughs> on the necks of journalists, but you will find that the editors and the journalists will succumb to the pressure as a result of that particular culture of that media house based on, you know, who are the sponsors, who are the persons who they're depending on for their um, advertising dollar and stuff like that. So the independence is something that they want to strive for. It's a more ambitious goal, but there's an interplay between who actually pays the piper and who's actually helping that newspaper or the radio or television or online platform to be sustained over time. But this does not bar the independence, all right, of those particular media establishment because the public interest remains sacrosanct to the whole process of transparency in the way in which the story is covered and how it is actually housed on the platform. It is only in this context that the public will be provided with the means to access credible, wholesome news that is trustworthy. Um, acknowledging sponsor provided content therefore becomes very, very necessary because their commercial concerns are political relationships that are essential in many cases, but transparency alone is not adequate in the sense that it does not entitle the journalists to lower their standards to fairness or truth. Regardless of who sponsors the segment, the journalists should strive at all times for the truth based on its, you know, here, you know, their fidelity to the public. So disclosure is very, very important apart from acknowledging the sponsor provided content. And of course, it does not justify the exclusion of perspectives on all sides as it relates to the audience's understanding of the issue, meaning that if a particular company that is not really on the side of the particular issue, or if that company is involved in that issue, the reporter has a duty to actually bring the, the, the company side as well as the other side that may be in conflict with the company to the perspectives of um, how they're bringing the story to the people. Journalists, now their proud translation of holding the powerful accountable provides no exemption, exception, rather, for powerful journalists or the powerful organizations that employ them. And of course, the profit from reporting on the activities of others while operating in secrecy is called hypocrisy. All right. So it is not a matter of really um, stripping themselves of that particular need to be gatekeepers or keeping those in power accountable. This is the very foundation of the First Amendment, the right to um, tell stories, the right to um, divulge the information, the freedom of information and stuff like that. So they have to make sure that at all times there is independence and transparency in the context of the organizations that employ them. And so if we look at, let's say, Fox, um, you know, over time, if, if you look at how Fox News reporters have been reporting, um, I'm not necessarily talking about the bona fide reporters, but there are some presenters, there are some producers who clearly took 
a particular perspective or a particular side. Um, just recently, there was um, a disclosure, or I, I would say an admission coming out on the part of uh, the Fox owner um, who acknowledged that there were people who were peddling um, the, you know, election steal in terms of, you know, the allegations that were made by former President Trump. And he came out and he said that I acknowledge that my network, in some cases, the persons who were there were buying um, of the narrative that was coming from former President Trump, and it was not correct in any way, shape, or form. So those journalists there, they have got to make sure that whether or not they're working for a leftist or a right-wing media, uh, they've got to always maintain independence and transparency. But it's easy for us to actually talk about that than to actually see it happening in reality. CNN has recently also made a move to make sure that there is what they call balance so that whoever is presenting there has been some shaking up and shuffling in terms of prime spots because they said they want to move away from being seen or perceived as a partisan network and so to profit from reporting on the activities of others while operating in secrecy like i said it's really hypocrisy moving right along effectively explaining editorial decisions and processes does not mean making excuses in the case of journalists and so transparency requires what, what it's called reflection, reconsideration, and honest openness to the possibility that an action, however well intended, was wrong. This is admitting that you have made a wrong decision or your particular publication was not necessarily in the best interest of the people. All right? In retrospect, that is, you go back and you admit. And so ethical journalism really requires owning one's errors, correcting them promptly and giving the corrections as much prominence as the error itself. If the journalist who's on television has reported something that is really erroneous, innocently erroneous, that is about someone whose name was called in a scandal, and they have subsequently found that they were wrong about the person's name, very next night, or within minutes of actually getting the correct information, they should let others know, the entire public who had access to that information know that they were wrong about the particular content. Commercial endorsements are incompatible with journalism because they compromise credibility. And so whenever content is gathered or selected, production should be actually listener-centered rather than an external source. Similarly, political activity and active advocacy can undercut the real or perceived independence of those who practice journalism. So journalists do not necessarily engage in political activity and endorsing one side or another because then they're stripped of their credibility and their ability to remain very objective, at least in the eyes of the public. So they do not give up the rights of citizenship. They have a right to have one side, but their public exercise of those rights can actually call into question their ability to be impartial as presenters, as reporters. We know that in the past, journalists have been called upon to actually endorse and they have actually refused. Some of them have been the moderators of debates and that is quite fine because it's within their purview as journalists. But when it comes to actually taking a decision to promote one side or another, then it becomes very problematic for their credibility and impartiality as journalists. Now, the acceptance of gifts, like I said, it's really a no-no because it creates conflicts of interest and it erodes independence and of course, Anything that is within this whole notion of professional courtesy and freebies, it is really something that is dissuaded in the context of independence and transparency. If there are enticements to report favorably, then it's really very, very, um, I would say, conflicting. And that's the reason why it is really something that will create suspicion on the part of the public. So commercial and political activities, just as much as gifts are wrong, um, it can harm any journalist even 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 though they may say, well, I'm actually off duty or I'm on my own time. You're never off duty as a journalist. Next, we come to the importance of attribution. And that's important information because it helps the audience to evaluate content and it also acknowledges those who contribute coverage. And so this is just as how we're, we, 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 we talked about the need for you to acknowledge other sources in your academic work in terms of plagiarism and attribution, it's the same with journalists. They have to at all times say and state the source of the information if they want it to be deemed as authentic or factual, all right? So 
it is very important for them to attribute. Journalism will also accept responsibility and articulate reasons, and of course, open the, the process to public scrutiny. Um, it provides enormous benefits to self-governing societies, and in the process, it can create some sort of inconvenience in some cases, discomfort, and even distress. And we see here that minimizing harm becomes very, very important, especially for vulnerable individuals, because it should be a consideration in every editorial or ethical decision making. Responsible reporting, we're talking now about accountability. It really means considering the consequences of both the news gathering, even if the information is never made public, and of the material's potential dissemination. In this particular context here, certain stakeholders deserve special consideration. These include children, victims, vulnerable adults. That these might be adults who are um, considered to be differently abled or disabled, and others in experience with American media. A vulnerable adults, maybe immigrant groups as well, who are classified in this particular manner. So in responsible reporting, whoever is reporting on the issue, let's say it's a border crossing, there should be a situation where um, they're getting special consideration in the context of how that particular issue is covered and disseminated. And of course, as we move along in terms of accountability for consequences consistent with the RTDNA guidelines, reporters are supposed to be aiming to preserve privacy and protecting the right of a fair trial. And of course, the, you know, it, it said that these are not the mission, but they're critical concerns and they should uh, always be in the purview of the reporter who's actually um, carrying that particular court story. All right. Um, yes, it's open court, but they've got to know how they're carrying the story. If they're carrying the story, giving one particular side only, then that particular case is going to be a case tried in the court of public opinion. And so in this particular context, there isn't going to be any balance. So if they're not, and, and in fact, they're not really there to preserve privacy and protect the rights of a fair trial, but they should consider all sides in terms of the coverage and how they're reporting that issue. Now, the right to broadcast, publish, or otherwise share information does not mean it is always right to do so. However, the journalist is actually obligated to pursue and report it rather than withhold it. And so shying away from difficult cases really should not be, you know, in the books of the journalists. They should think about those ethical challenges and, of course, report them and leave tougher, sensitive stories to non-journalists. Um, if, if they do that, it can be said to be a disservice. So the journalist is really supposed to be challenging um, himself, herself. Journalists should challenge themselves to go beyond that which is very, very simple to report on. It means that the journalist has got to go to background that story. It means that the journalist has, has got to go to check to see exactly what occurred in the person's life earlier, if there was a previous case against them. Context has to be built up so that the public can understand exactly how that particular ruling came into effect if they're covering that particular case or that story. How did that particular individual arrive at that situation um, of committing that crime? Did they have a previous history? Um, who are their family members? Who are their neighbors? Um, did they have a, a mental crisis at one point or another in their lives? Did they have access to media? You know, what were their particular circumstances leading up to the story? So it's not reporting on the obvious, but it's getting beyond the obvious so that the public can have a full breadth of the issues that pertain to that particular story, all right? So like I said, the right to broadcast, publish, or otherwise share information does not mean it's always right to do so, but they're obligated you know, to pursue the truth and report on every aspect of that story without withholding it. If it's a breach of privacy or if it does not necessarily meet the humanitarian good, then it may be in this particular classification of sharing the information and the rightfulness of sharing the information. But if it's within the public right to know and the public good based on what we discussed weeks ago in terms of the value of the information to the people, then it's very, very, very important for the public to actually know and give it, giving them something that is beyond just the surface of that issue. Now, I'd like to encourage you to go back to the RTDNA guidelines, the Code of Ethics, because this may serve you well for your EITN assignments.